Well, uh, good morning to everybody uh, joining us from the Americas. Good afternoon to everyone in Europe and uh, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa region. My name is Ramesh Feitelengam and I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, webinar on long-term growth and data transparency. This is the latest in a series of uh, webinars organized by the Economic Research Forum based in Cairo and the World Bank uh, team focused on the Middle East region based in Washington, D.C. Um, I've been working with the ERF for some years now as a, I'm an economics writer and consultant, one of the founding editors of the forum, uh, which is a website we set up uh, two and a half years ago to communicate uh, research uh, of relevance to policymakers across the MENA region. Uh, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome today three fantastic speakers to uh, talk about a chapter in the new World Bank report, their April update on the region which goes under the title, How Transparency Can Help the Middle East and North Africa. So we're going to have uh, uh, an initial presentation by Asif Islam, who's a senior economist for the MENA region at the World Bank. And he's going to be uh, addressing this, this uh, top topic that we've uh, called the webinar, Long-Term Growth and Data Transparency. A short summary of, his, uh, of, of what he's going to be saying is actually posted already on the forum. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, post a clip. I'll post a link to that uh, in the chat on, the, uh, on, the, on Zoom, so you can uh, take a look at that while you're listening to him, if you like, and read it afterwards. We'll hear from Asif in a moment. He'll be talking for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to be hearing from two discussants. And I'm pleased to welcome Hadi Esfahani, who's joining us uh, from, where we're from uh, Illinois. Uh, he's a professor of economics and business administration at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. So he's a few hours behind many of us. Uh, Hadi's research is, uh, focuses on theoretical and empirical issues in the political economy of development, uh, fiscal policy, trade policy, regulatory policies, uh, focusing particularly on the region. And he's been a consultant to the World Bank on regulation in developing countries. I'm also pleased to uh, welcome uh, Khalid Abu Ishmael, and particularly pleased to see him because he's been a uh, very um, prolific uh, contributor to the forum website. And it's, I've had the pleasure of working with him over, over a number of years now. Khalid is Chief of Economic Development and Poverty Section at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. And he's coming into us uh, from Beirut. So uh, the, the format, as I say, will be Asif will give the initial presentation. Uh, Hadi and Khalid will then respond and then we'll have some time for some Q&A. And if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a, uh, a button called Q&A into which at any time during the proceedings, you could uh, type the question addressed to one or all of our speakers. Uh, they have the option to reply to you with a, with a uh, text reply in there, or I might, may, we may have time for me to raise that with them in the conversation. There's also a chat button as well in, in, in which uh, you can communicate with individual participants uh, or, or with, with, uh, with all of us here, all panelists and all attendees. So once again, very, very good to have you all listening in and we look forward to your questions. And I'm now going to hand over to Asif Islam for his opening presentation. Asif, over to you. Uh, thank you, Ramesh. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation on economic growth and data transparency in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, my name is Asif Islam. I'm a senior economist with the World Bank Manager Chief Economist Office. This is a series of presentations on the findings of the MENA Economic Update on how transparency can help the Middle East and North Africa. So to set the scene, uh, one of the key observations we have of the region is this low growth. We call this MENA's chronic low growth syndrome, and this is visually visualized on the right-hand side in the graph. What we present in this graph is uh, per capita GDP growth rates from 2000 to 2022, that's forecasting two years into the future. The blue diamonds is the growth rates for each country in the region. The red bars is the, me, the median GDP growth rates, GDP per capita growth rates for the res, respective income groups. So the median is a mediocre benchmark. And the one thing that should strike you is by far, most of the countries in the region underperform in comparison to this benchmark. This is a challenge we see that we think will persist into the future with very, very few exceptions. 
So our main hypothesis or our key question is, do we think data transparency is part of this story? Uh, there are a few things we know. We know there's a widening data gap between men and advanced economies. We know that advanced economies have modern and well-coordinated data collection systems. We know that this data is accessible to a wide community involving researchers, institutions, media, and civil society. We also know that MENA, many economies in the MENA region have lagged in the capacity to generate data. And we also know that right now under the pandemic, we, we know transparency is more important than ever. More importantly, credibility is crucial and this can only be created through trust, which can be forged by transparency. We also know that countries now have more responsibility in generating data. The UN SDGs have really given the responsibility for countries to create the data necessary for the indicators. So given all these things that we know, can we, can we go forward and push this link between data transparency, reliability, and growth? Now, before, uh, before I go forward, I want to give you a quick summary of what my, the whole point of this presentation is and give you an outline going forward. There are essentially three key messages you should take out of this presentation. As I just showed, uh, men as a whole has suffered from chronic low growth. It is the only developing region to fall in data reliability or transparency between 2005 and 2018. Our preliminary economic est econometric estimations indicate about a loss of between 70, se sorry, 7 to 14% of GDP per capita due to this fall in data reliability and transparency. So for the rest of the presentation, I will go through the state of data transparency in the region. I will then link that to economic growth and then I'll provide two illustrations of challenges in the region. So how do we measure data transparency and reliability? Well, well the World Bank has come up with something called the Statistical Capacity Index. We interpret this as the data transparency and reliability measure. What it does is it captures three things. One, it captures the availability and periodicity of microdata. This also includes administrative data. Second, it sees whether the data systems adhere to international standards. A good example is think national accounts. And then finally, it looks at the periodicity and timeliness of 10 socioeconomic macro indicators. So what you have on the left-hand side is a fitted line for 149 developing economies between the overall statistical capacity score and the level of development for 2005. We replicate the same thing on the right-hand side, but that's for 2018. So two things should strike you from, from these sets of graphs. Uh, the first is this seems to be a positive correlation between the level of development and statistical capacity. The second is that the MENA region has dropped between 2005 and 2018 in statistical capacity, or what we call data transparency and reliability. Uh, it is the only region to have dropped and it now has the lowest score. There is, of course, a lot of variation within the MENA region. Uh, when you look at the statistical capacity score for 2018, you have Iran and Egypt on one end of the spectrum, and you have Libya, Syria, and Yemen on the other end. And automatically, you must think that, okay, so, so countries in conflict are li less likely to have good data systems. That makes sense. But that's not the full story. You also have countries here that are not in conflict but are still performing poorly. So how are we arguing for this story that data transparency and reliability relates to growth? We, we think of three main mechanisms. There can be more. Uh, the first is the idea that good policy and reforms depend on credible and timely data. This is based on the idea that your policies are only as good as the empirical evidence they're based on. Data is fundamental about records, and I like to think of, the, of an example of a business to help you know, to illustrate this. So uh, business managers, they need to raise profits, and they do this by benchmarking their performance with themselves in the past and with the competitors. They need to leverage collateral. Uh, they also need to balance risk and reward to decide what ventures are worth it. All of this requires really good record keeping, a good understanding of what is going on. Second, we, we believe that when data is accessible to broader civil society, it can generate better policies and reforms. And this is based on the idea that if you have a larger community that's testing hypotheses, they're debating and disputing findings, 
and that results in establishment robust facts and relationships. And our hope is from this whole process, the best ideas emerge. Also, it's important to know that when data is of questionable quality or is unavailable, the gap between perceptions and reality may grow. This means that governments that embark on welfare, improving policies or reforms may have little impact on public perceptions. Part of this is because there's limited data tracking these improvements. And one of the fears is that this gap could manifest in terms of social protests and unrest. More importantly, once a government walks down this path of lack of transparency, it may be very difficult to regain credibility. So this is the process we, we sort of envision to summarize it all. Uh, a country's data capacity will determine the raw data, the quality of the raw data generated. Then we'll have academics, policymakers, think tanks, they engage and they generate knowledge from this raw data. They debate the findings within themselves. Once this is turned into information that can be digestible by, by media institutions, they join in and then communicate this information to the public Hopefully the public takes ownership of this debate and our hope is a set of optimal policies that come out of this process. So now a bit into the technicalities of how we try to relate data transparency and reliability and economic growth. We, we basically think of two types of estimations and this is depending on the nature of the data of how we transform it. So the first is a cross-sectional analysis. Uh, we basically regress the GDP per capita growth between 2005 and 2018 on the 2000 levels of data capacity, GDP per capita, and other control variables. In the panel data estimations, we do the same thing, but we allow variation across time and across countries. We have GDP per capita growth on the left-hand side. We regress on the initial levels of GDP per capita as well as the data transparency, transparency and reliability measure, as well as other controls. The panel data, panel estimation also allows us to account for time fixed effects and we account for random country effects as well. We also include a specification where we lag both the data capacity indicator and other controls to try and argue some at least weak exogeneity. Our sample varies. We have from about 98 to 136 economies. Uh, this really depends on what set of controls we include in our estimations. Uh, some of, for some countries, the data is sporadic. So when, when, when you see these types of estimations, there, there's one thing that comes to everyone's mind, and this is the issue of simultaneity bias, or in other words, reverse causality. I think most people, when they think about data and growth, they think, oh, well, you know, it might be that it's richer and fast growing countries that have the ability to have good data. And this is something we take to heart and we worry quite a bit in our estimations. And we try to limit it as much as we can. We, we can't fully get rid of it, but we try our best. So what we do in our cross-section analysis is we look growth far off into the future, 2005 to 2018, and regress it at the 2005 levels of data capacity. We hope this kind of limits the reverse causality somewhat. In our panel estimations, we use random effects. We also use sophisticated system GMM estimations to try and limit this as much as we can. The other issue this sets of estimations face is omitted variable bias. We could be missing some important elements that we can't measure or not include in the estimation. We, we try to limit this as the best we can. We control for the sector composition of the economy, education, trade, and a variety of political institution variables. So what are our results? If you look at our first model using the OLS estimations with the cross-sectional data set, we find a positive correlation between statistical capacity score and the diff log difference of GDP per capita. It is statistically significant. Now, uh, the results stand whether you include controls or not, and that's the difference between the first and second columns. In this table, we present the panel results. Uh, from columns one to four, we provide the random country effects with your fixed effects. Uh, as you can see, uh, the correlation is positive and statistically significant, and this is stronger when we lag the statistical capacity score, which is in columns three and four, and the results hold whether we include controls or not. We, we don't report the country fixed effects. Uh, to be upfront, our results didn't work, but we know from studies such as Nickel 1991 that fixed country effects, especially with this dynamic panel setup, tends to produce inconsistent estimates. And of course, we have the system GMM estimations. This largely takes care of the fixed country effects. 
to not to get too technical, but to give you a rough idea how the system GMM works is that you estimate your equation in terms of levels and differences. In your levels equations, the endogenous variable is instrumented by the lag differences. And in the differences equation, your endogenous variable is instru instrumented by the lag levels. But the takeaway point is the results are robust. Now, um, this, this speaks to a large literature on cross-country growth regressions. And we all know they have a lot of flaws. There is a well-established large critique on it. So we don't expect to have the final word on this. Our goal is to try our best within the context of the growth empirics literature. Our main aim is to have this be part of the conversation and hopefully studies down the road can do better with the internal validity of these estimates. But if you took these estimates to heart uh, with all the caveats that come with it, you would see that basically the loss in GDP per capita in the region due to the fall in statistical capacity is about seven to 14% of GDP per capita. Now I'm gonna move on to, to two illustrations of data challenges in the region. Uh, this, these examples go beyond the statistical capacity indicator, which is not all encompassing, although it does, it does a good job of ca capturing essential elements. So the first is regarding gross public debt. Uh, this is not reported consistently across many economies. Many countries do not report many components of public debt. And you can imagine this hinders a lot of the efforts to understand the region's macro macroeconomic fragility. In terms of labor markets, uh, there's inconsistent reporting of unemployment rates. Uh, this unemployment rates differ considerably based on what definition is used. And this is not innocuous. It affects specific subgroups, gender being an example. So in this table, what I have in each row is subsectors of the public sector and each column countries across the region. A check, a tick indicates the country reports this type of debt and has it. Across means indicates this country has this type of debt, but does not report it. Not applicable means, which is N stroke A, means that the country does not have this type of debt. Blank cells means we just don't know. We don't know if they don't have this type of debt at all, but we sure know they don't report it. In terms of employment and unemployment, we have a table that basically looks at the countries in the region and see if they follow the ILO definitions of unemployment and employment. For unemployment, you need a couple of things. One, you have a defined age group. You have to know whether they are out of work, whether they're available for work, and whether they're seeking work. For employment, you need to know whether it's paid employment or self-employment. And as you can see, the variation across the region. Now, one of the, and my colleague Nelly in the upcoming presentation will go far more detail into this. I'm just giving you a preview essentially, is that what happens is we took the, the ERF's uh, labor market panel surveys and tried to reproduce the unemployment rates in Egypt, Jordan, Tunisia, and we were unable to do so. Now for unemployment, the definition really matters. Uh, there are two things to consider. One, are you considering subsistence or not? Two, are you considering whether someone is actively seeking work or not? If you are not considering subsistence, then you are using the market definition of employment. If you're considering subsistence, you're looking at the extended definition of employment. If you're, if you're considering whether someone is actively seeking for work, then you're looking at the standard definition of unemployment. If you are considering whether or not they're actively seeking, you're looking at the broader definition of unemployment and what definition you use matters. So this is the female unemployment rate for Egypt, Jordan, and Tunisia with the various variations of the definition. And one quick takeaway point is that if you use the market definition and remove the actively searching requirement, the female unemployment rates is much higher than the national estimates. So to conclude, um, we think that Data transparency may have cost the region in terms of growth. Uh, the ongoing pandemic has put this issue at the forefront. We need good data and investments are necessary to build data capacity. We need data to be widely accessible. And for this, we need good data agreements. Our goal right now is just to bring the data transparency challenge to the table. And we hope future initiatives will dig deeper, uh, all technology and country specific contexts. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much, Asif, and thank you very much uh, for sticking uh, right on time. That's uh, excellent. So uh, let me remind um, viewers that uh, you can submit questions using the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your, your screen. But I'm now going to uh, invite uh, Hadi Esfahani to uh, um, make his comments on uh, what Asif has done and maybe broaden out the conversation. Hadi, you, you're going to share your screen with us as well. Over to you. Good evening or afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Very nice to see you all. And let me share my screen and start my discussion of this paper, this chapter. Okay, so I'm glad to uh, be able to participate in this debate uh, because it, I think it's a very important set of issues being discussed. So the report really asks good questions and raises important issues. Definitely transparency is good in many situations, especially when one thinks about control of corruption. This is a very important matter. Also, as the report discusses and points out, transparency may be helpful during a pandemic. But as an economist, you know, I have to think about contingencies and ifs and buts. And it, I ask the question, is transparency always good? In, in fact, there's an example from the pand current pandemic that makes us think. So, Suppose that social distancing um, is suboptimal if the market is left to itself due to externalities. People may show up at work too much and pass on the disease too much because they need the money. So in this situation, we know that the governments have issued lockdowns and also are paying people to stay home away from work. But one can also think about possibility of not providing the full transparent data on this matter in order to make sure that people don't go to work uh, as, as often as they want or as much as they want. In fact, there's this recent paper that develops a model of equilibrium uh, pandemic and also economic performance of the country. And it seems that the information provided by political leaders in that situation do matter. And that's one of the reasons why I thought one should think about this, that is transparency always good? I'm not 100% sure. Now, does transparency raise long-term economic growth as the report argues? I would say maybe, but the case I don't see being made in this report. In fact, the connection between transparency and growth are quite complicated, as already Asif uh, acknowledged that in uh, his presentation. There's the issue of endogeneity and simultaneity in the data. In fact, I have seen quite often governments become far less transparent when the economy is not doing very well. And the, the economy is doing well, they're more than happy to share the information. So that's the reverse causality. Now, the, the way the uh, Asif and colleagues have estimated the model, they try to identify the effect of transparency on uh, and data, data availability on economic growth. But I'll discuss that in, in a moment. So looking at the model being estimated, I'm not convinced. Um, the, I don't think that endogeneity is quite addressed. I can discuss this in more detail, but I just want to point this out. And one of, let me just point out that one of the problems could be that in, there's an endogeneity of control variables themselves. And that could not just the variable that is of interest, in this case, data transparency or statistical capacity. 
for example, th th there's another issue uh, um, that I found, find um, missing here. A lot of institutional variables are included, but the one that I would have thought would be number one that should be included in among institutional variables, in government effectiveness is not there. And uh, that may actually looks like including that variable might actually take away the significance of statistical capacity. Now, in the, re in the report, the information provided about the regression is also not quite trans transparent. Even in the presentation, there were some details that were, were not uh, clear. I'm saying this, uh, teasing, uh, in fact, us a little bit on this in a paper about transparency, reporting regressions that are not 100% transparent, for example. We always need the list of GMM instruments in order to be able to evaluate GMM estimates. And also, they quote Hansen tests, but there are, in fact, two Hansen tests, and it's not clear which one it is that they're reporting endogeneity or over-identification. Now, let me comment on the nature of transparency. Is it really transparency or trust that matters? And I think trust is the main concern, in fact. Transparency, the way we define it, whether the data is shared or not, whether it's accurate or not, that's one thing. Trust that the information, the, from the government is in fact the best that they have and they do make effort to provide good data and good policy. That's I think the main issue. If there's no trust whether the government is in fact transparent or not doesn't matter because people doubt the information anyway. Transparency may help improve trust. That's a very important function of it but it's not the same thing as trust. In, in fact, it's very important to ask ourselves why is transparency not there in the Middle East and North Africa? It's not accidental. It's not politicians being ignorant, I think. In fact, you know, to, let's step back and ask the question, what's the politicians or government's objectives. Is it improving welfare or preserving power? And in this sense, when I read the report, I felt that it is trying to preach the goodness of transparency, but I wasn't sure who's the audience. Is it just creating awareness? For whom? Is it educating the politicians? so that they know that the transparency is good and practice it, or they're informing the public in order to mobilize them to put pressure on the politicians. I think those things need to be uh, clarified because obviously politicians are not motivated to be transparent and or can't build trust with the public. The whole scheme, the whole this, uh, discussion is, should be cast in a different light. The report also talks about transparency and statistical capacity and sometimes use them interchangeably. I realize that the others understand difference and basically are thinking statistical capacity as a component of transparency. And it's true that statistical capacity is important and it's likely to help improve policy quality. But that also depends to the extent, the extent to which governments make serving the public a priority. Transparency is probably very good most of the time. But again, we should be careful, not always have, having transparent information av made available immediately is the best thing to do. For example, let's say there are some lobbies that get information faster than others, are more effective in blocking policies, and you want to carry out a reform. If you make your plans available too early, 
th these guys may succeed and that may block good reforms. Let me finish very quickly by saying a couple of words about the examples, lack of transparency in public debt reporting. That's a good point is being made. It's a major problem in many countries. And the mismeasurement of employment and employment, probably I, I think it's not a big deal. And I don't see the connection with growth through that factor. There's the variation in unemployment matters, not the exact level. In fact, when you explain to non-specialists how the ILO measures or defines employment and unemployment, they're usually shocked. And let me finish because I've, I've gone a bit over time and see what questions are there and also hear from Khaled and others. Thank you very much, Heidi, for those remarks. That's, that's terrific. Um, so I mentioned earlier that uh, you can put questions to uh, the, any of the panelists or all of the panelists in the by using the Q and A button. I'm reminded that an alternative way to do it when we're when we're done with the presentations is that you go if you click on the panelist button, you'll see the list of uh, uh, participants button. You'll see a list of uh, attendees, and you can. Uh, opt to raise your hand and, and that will be signaled to me and I can uh, come to you and we can get you on and hear from you uh, directly. But for the moment, let me hand over to our second uh, discussant and uh, Khalid is also going to share his screen with us. Khalid, we, uh, we welcome uh, what your thoughts on this, uh, on this um, subject. Thank you, uh, Ramesh. Um, can you see the screen now? Okay. Yes, we can. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to have this uh, very interesting conversation. Um, as a person, personally, as somebody who is dealing with poverty and inequality in the region, I do appreciate the value of uh, transparency. And um, I would, uh, uh, you know, want to also say that it's, 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 it is an issue, especially from a, a researcher's uh, point of view. But um, the, there are, as Hedy is saying, there are many issues, um, complex issues that are embodied in um, the assumption that uh, more transparency would lead to 7 to 14% um, percent higher growth rate long term. I, I think that's, uh, in a way, I found it even counterintuitive. I mean, it's just the order of magnitude. But, um, but I, I think the report and the issue is very important. I think the... Um, you know, I think it's 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 definitely worth uh, our discussion now. I have general comments which I'm not going to get into too much detail about. I um, I can share them with uh, with you, Asif, later. Um, I think the index may not be computed, for example, for many high income countries and in developed economies. That might affect some of the uh, models inferences. Also, I looked at um, uh, you know the index itself in in, in slide twenty two, um, and uh, I have some other questions on it in, in, in terms of uh, how it's constructed. Uh, but these are detailed questions that I think maybe we can discuss uh, later on. Um, one issue is that you might because you say there and it, you're 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 dealing with a lot of MDG indicators. You might want to move to the SDGs as you know the MDGs now might be a bit ob obsolete. Um, Issues related to uh, reverse causality, I think, are already addressed, so I'm not going to dwell too much uh, on that. Uh, clearly, uh, my main issue here is with um, the causality versus the, the correlation. And obviously, uh, you know, even with the best of uh, models, it would uh, be a stretch to claim this kind of causality, as, as, as Hedy was referring to. But I like the description. I mean, it was clear that you're describing a process that starts with the data sharing to academics and moves to public policy debates, uh, media, then some kind of optimal decision making that leads to a higher welfare. Uh, well, there are two problems with this. First, it's quite a long chain of um, causal links. Um, and, and, and the other issue is, as Hedy was saying, you could probably have some uh, the same results emanating from a different conceptual background. Let me give you two examples um, from in, in one setting, which is closer to the new classical setting, you know, transparency, I can see why transparency would 
be great for growth because it would allow thousands of optimizing agents to make better consumption investment decisions. And therefore, you can see a link between uh, that and the productivity gains, and therefore, the link is clear. But from a structuralist uh, macro perspective, um, I can give you another situation where growth is directly linked to distributional uh, factors, which results from social contracts and, and political economy factors. For example, if you assume that a country has very high level of initial inequality in which poor households they spend most of their wages on food, mainly imported food, middle class houses spend on locally produced goods, you've got rich houses, households uh, spending on imported luxury goods. In this case, obviously, a real allocation from rich uh, to poor or lower middle class house, uh, households would lead to uh, increased growth. But um, in, in the second story, I'm not sure whether you would need a lot of transparency to get that impact. What you need is an appropriate set of fiscal policies and a lot of technocratic wisdom. Um, but the transparency itself is not clear uh, how it would contribute to that. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that it, it, regardless of your theoretical standpoint, the correlation is there, but it's the causal link that I think is a bit more disputed. And then the other issue which was raised by Hattie is the, the real question is what determines transparency itself? And this is of course a tough one to, 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 to generalize, but I would argue that it's, it's a broader issue that has to do with political economy factors. It has to do with your level of income, level of human development. I know you controlled for that in, in the regression, but uh, I'm also trying to, to, to tell a story here that uh, the evidence shows that uh, transparency depends so much on a particular type of uh, uh, governance and, 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 and voice and accountability and, and government effectiveness. So the more interesting question for me is actually what would be the relationship between these determining uh, governance factors? What I've done here is basically just to show that it's the level of governance uh, uh, that would also bring about a lot of uh, develop, developmental, uh, uh, varying de developmental impacts, is to look at the scatter plot from um, you know, 2000 to 2018, almost uh, 3,000 uh, uh, data points here. Uh, and you can see here, uh, this is the, a, a, um, a governance index that we've constructed, and, and we use it in ESCO sometimes, was basically normalized from zero to one, voice and accountability and rule of law, the same World Bank data set. Correlate that with the GNI index from zero to one that they use in also for the HDI calculations. And you can see that below a certain threshold of good governance, which again determines uh, transparency, there's a lot of variation in terms of growth. So the story is very messy for, um, you know, at lower levels of, of governance. There are so many different outcomes of growth. Uh, so that's also what you see when you look at other factors that you have in your regression equation. Below a certain level of governance, the education index, uh, educational outcomes vary, vary uh, significantly. And it's also the case uh, with life expectancy, even though it's uh, probably uh, less uh, variation. Uh, if you take out that governance index and remove it with another one like uh, government effectiveness, as Hedy was saying, and look at HDI, you also see that uh, outcome. So it's not, you know, it, 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 it seems here, what I'm trying to say is that same thing with control of uh, corruption and regulatory quality and HDI. Below a certain level of governance, the story is very different. It really depends uh, on where you are in terms of your level. So back to my main question, uh, what are the political economy factors that are driving the low transparency? You know, of course, in all of these uh, charts, the, the location of Arab countries is very well known. We have low transparency, but we also have very low uh, governance indicators. And what's causing that, I think Hadi alluded to that, is uh, you know, basically a traditional social contract uh, which in many of the writings of the political economy explain it because of, you know, the oil riches and the spillover effects that lead to some kind of rent-seeking behavior. 
high subsidies, low taxation, low representation, low accountability. So in this context, you would expect that there's no room for a lot of uh, transparency. In other words, as we've argued in our ERF uh, ESCO report on inequality, what we've seen is a lot of social policy, good social policy outcomes in the region, but a lot of bad or poor rentier economic policies and governance outcomes that fail to capitalize on these uh, good social policy outcomes. And some of them, at least quantitatively, were, were good. And that what basically uh, can be characterized by an inequality trap, as the World Bank report itself, a famous World Bank report on inequality says. It's an inequality trap where you have concentrated political and economic power reinforcing these existing inequalities. So in this case, there's no incentive for reform, as Hadi was, was saying. So this is my last slide here, and it has to go uh, has to do with, with the, the heart of the issue, which is uh, the incentive problem. If you want to have better data transparency, you need better governance and better accountability mechanisms. But to get these better accountability uh, mechanisms, you need to have an incentive, a motivation for reform. With the current social contract and development models, that does not exist. But there could be, and this is my last point here, there could be a light at the end of the, the tunnel. When Paul Collier, Professor Collier was asked, you know, how do you get that incentive? He asked us in, in the last ERF conference to look at the uh, projected oil rents per capita. And as you can see from the graph, it's going down. So that could be perhaps an incentive for more accountability and better data sharing. I'll stop here. Uh, over to you, Romash. Thank you very much, Kai. That's great. So thanks to all our presenters. Uh, if, this, if we were meeting in real life, what I would now do is ask for a, a show of hands and collect up uh, three or four questions to put to uh, one or all of the uh, panelists. But we have had some questions come in on uh, the uh, Q&A. So I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll read, read out the ones that uh, the, and, and any of the panelists might want to pick these up. And then I'm also going to uh, give the microphone to Adam Ahmed, who has got his hand raised. So, uh, Shireen, if you could uh, give Adam access to ask his question in a moment. But first of all, while you're doing that, let me uh, put the questions that have come up. A uh, question to uh, Asif do, uh, from uh, Mohammed Zimam, a former central bank governor in Yemen. Does the World Bank have different scenarios to deal with the low-income countries which they used? They have, uh, would have many economic issues before COVID and which today have become more difficult. Uh, Subadi Togan asks, Transparency is essential for efficient allocation of resources. Without transparency, there is no competition. Could you comment on these issues? Uh, Ad Albino says, as far as growth is concerned, do panelists believe that we should differentiate between the transparency of macroeconomic data and microeconomic data? Uh, and Mohsin Khan says, this paper relates long-term growth and data transparency, but the equations are estimated using annual data, which is short-term growth. So a few, a few uh, challenges for you there, but Adam, uh, have we got you uh, on the line now? So you could put your question directly to the panelists. Shireen, are you able to do that? Yes, I am. Adam? You need to unmute yourself. There we go. Hello. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Yeah. How are you? Fine. Uh, my, my, uh, thank you. Thank you for this nice information and for the presentation. My question is that we face a problem of uh, food security information availability, reliability, and accessibility uh, in the normal situation. But this problem is particularly aggravated during this pandemic because it is, very, it is very useful information, so as to make a very useful decision to overcome this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Asif, do you want, do you want to uh, pick up uh, one or two of those questions which you'd like to respond and uh, give us some comments? And then Hadi and Khaled, you signal to me if, if you'd like to respond on any of them. Asif, first of all. Uh, thank you, Hadi, Khalid. Thank you, Ramesh. And thank you, various attendants, and some very great questions. 
uh, these are the type of conversations we want to have and this is the type of feedback we want as well. Uh, I have several uh, comments and responses, but due to time I'll select a few and I'm happy to take many others offline. Um, yes, during the pandemic, data availability and transparency is more important than ever. That's, that's well accepted, well acknowledged and something I hope makes this conversation uh, more important and more people engaged uh, towards it, without a doubt. Uh, Hadi had some great po points, uh, one on transparency, and the question is very nuanced. It's whether you know, full transparency versus partial transparency, could there be some negative feedbacks? And there is a literature emerging on that. Uh, I would point out too that when we talk about data transparency and reliability in MENA, we're talking about something much more fundamental, right? It's something that a lot of economies have that are developed, which we do lack in MENA economies. So, so, so take this to heart. There is definitely a wider discussion when it comes to the full range of transparency. On both comments from Khalid and Hadi on the endogeneity of control variables and the issues, estimations, points well taken. This is the issue that anyone engaging in the empirical growth literature has to face, and we, we accept them quite a bit. Uh, we are well aware of them, and we, we, we at best, uh, hope to convince you, at worst, bring this conversation to the table. So a range between that is, is a victory for us. Um, the Khalid has a very interesting point in the index, and, and I appreciate that. That's a very good close look. To confirm, yes, the index is mainly for developing economies. It does not include advanced economies. With that, I'm gonna kind of pitch something the World Bank Data Group is doing for the upcoming World Development Report on Data, is they're coming up with a new index that would include developed economies as well. That's their plan, so stay tuned to see where that goes. Um, I think, yeah, so all the other points on endogeneity of controls, the importance of economy for various factors, great point on looking at the determinants of data transparency. It's a very useful compositions to have there too. Um, some questions on the, from, the, from attendance. One is about long-term versus short-term growth. Conceptually, we have laid out an argument for long-term growth, but we, we are constrained by what data is available. And so 2005, 2018 is the data we have for the index. Um, but yes, uh, these are the questions I can think of so far. Anything else I'm happy? discuss further. Uh, Steve, uh, Hardy or Kali, you can signal to me in the traditional way by raising your hand if you'd like to uh, uh, respond on the on some of the comments that just uh, just came in there. Who, who would you, which of you would like to uh, to pick some of those things up? Okay. No one, I think Hadi um, Hadi has uh, his he's trying to you you're on mute Hadi. Ah. <laughs> Can we unmute him uh Shireen? Ah, Sorry. Uh, uh, let Khaled respond and I'll I'll get to to it in a moment. Okay. Oh, I think there was a question. I think there was a question on uh, food security and transparency. Uh, uh, if I understood the question uh, correctly, um, currently, yes. I mean, this is an issue. We're in a region that imports about 110 uh, billion uh, a year. Uh, we're one of the most arid and most food insecure regions. 65%, uh, if I recall correctly, of the region's uh, uh, cereals are imported. And we already have very high and uh, probably even higher projected now uh, uh, poverty uh, and food insecure uh, population. So clearly you want, this is the kind of uh, indicator where you want to get more transparency on. Um, and in fact, uh, what we've been doing at ESCO, we've been trying to, to, to make continuous projections of uh, the level of extreme poverty. But let me tell you what the problem is. In March, um, when we had the data coming in from DESA and the World Bank, our estimates were basically that uh, you're going to have more, 8 million people more uh, poor population as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. In April, just one month, a few weeks afterwards, it, the growth situation completely changed. And that figure suddenly multiplied by three, according to our last estimates, it could reach now 20 million more 
So uh, again, this is the situation that we're in. We're dealing with a black swan type of event and it's very hard for you to uh, make, even if you're transparent, there's a certain quality of your projections that is, uh, has to be questioned because you don't know what is going on. You know, it's the, the crisis is moving much faster than your ability to make projections, which usually are based on stable trajectories. You're no longer there. And, and, and that's another issue that uh, I think would encourage more data transparency because you need to have more conversation about the quality of your uh, projections. Back to you, uh, Romesh. Hadi, uh, over to you. Okay, well, Khaled made mo all the points, the important points, and uh, very nicely said. Uh, Subide had asked about data transparency being important for competition, or basically transparency generally, and I definitely agree. I think in most cases, um, transparency is absolutely important. What I was trying to do is to be, make sure that we're clear that there are situations where data transparency may not be the best thing to do. And they may be rare, but there are some situations like that. And more importantly, data transparency itself, we can't just wish it that there should be better data transparency. There has to be motives and incentives as Khaled also pointed out and analyzed it. Great, thank you. Can I can I, can I put a, a a couple of questions to the to the panelists? Um, what, one thing that struck me was saying that you know, there must be some kind of we're economists, so we must think there's an optimal point. There's optimal transparency at some point. Where and where where is that point? And where do different uh, countries in the region lie, for example? And th and then we've been talking about long term issues, but I mean in this pandemic there are lots of short term transparency issues, and we're seeing. In, in the Western world, great contrast in how transparent governments are and what their objective is in dealing with the pandemic. And in, in, I'm, I'm here, I'm in the UK, where, where the general feeling is the government is not, has not been at all clear uh, on what, what its agenda is for, for uh, approaching the pandemic. Uh, in Australia and New Zealand, it seems there is a much greater clarity and there's a great difference in the outcomes. Even within the United States, you've got the federal agency where it's not at all clear what the president's agenda is. And then you've got the governor of the state of New York who is talking daily to his people at a press conference explaining exactly what he's doing, exactly what the science is, exactly what the different policies are. So give, can you give me a sense of how, the, how that kind of transparency and, and effectiveness of communication is working out in different countries in the region? Who, who wants to pick either of those up? Maybe Asif should, should start. Uh, any comments on this, Asif? Yes, <laughs> Great, great comment, Ramesh. Uh, very interesting point, and it's something we're seeing day to day. Um, I would also like to uh, be a bit more specific on the argument we're trying to make. The advanced economies have a different set of issues. In the developing MENA region, we have uh, a very specific type of issue, and that comes to something fundamental about data. Very important, basic information we are lacking throughout the region. Right? This comes from a lot of lack of labor force service and so on and so forth. So sure, there's this more wider range of transparency we have to think about, but we need to get the fundamentals right. Our statistical capacity index goes at these fundamental issues. And then from that, you, you could have a larger discussion on a number of other things. Great, thank, thank you. Re remember that there are, you can ask questions in the Q&A, but uh, Khalid uh, Hadi, do you want to... Uh, Get your communication in a pandemic. Yeah. Uh, let me say a couple of points here. Um, at this point, we, we're th thinking about data availability and transparency. But as far as the pandemics is concerned, and the example you mentioned, com difference between UK, maybe US also in similar way, and Australia and New Zealand, it, it may not be issue of transparency it may be just issue of incompetence and confusion in the heads of the leaders. <laughs> so, so we can be absolutely transparent about how confused they are. And I think that's become very clear, at least in the US. <laughs> so so, so uh, it, it's the good question you asked, what's the optimal level of transparency? I, I'm, the question I'm raising is that there could be some level of transparency that is in, 
improves on on the or maybe less transparency than 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 full transparency that might be optimal in some situations. But that's very situation specific, and I think there are too many variables at this point to summarize. It's just a caution that I'm, I'm pointing out. Okay, thank you, Khalid. What what, what do things look like from uh, from where you're sitting in Beirut? Um, it's a it's a, it's a it's a tough question. Um, I mean, again, look at it from the perspective of a, go a government in the region that has very high uh, inequality, um, and they and they probably know it. Um, so according to our latest research, we have an estimated around 5.7 trillion wealth uh, owned by the population of the region. 4.3 of that 5.7 goes to the top decile. And the top 37 billionaires on the Forbes list um, own as much as the bottom 110 million adults. So these are not exactly the kinds of figures um, that you would readily be willing to be transparent about. But, but I would argue that under the current circumstances, maybe you should, because with the current fiscal space problems in almost all Arab countries, and we've seen what Saudi Arabia has done a couple of days ago, uh, with, you don't really want to go for the same business as usual, um, VAT regressive taxation policies. You probably want to do more direct taxation. You probably want to, uh, do more wealth taxation, as we're arguing in ESQA in a, in a, in a policy brief that will come out recently, uh, in, 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 a couple, in a couple of days or so. And that would require a certain level of uh, transparency that is not there. But I think maybe, the, as I said, the incentive structures may be changing because of situations like what we're in. Whether or not that will lead to this conversation, I don't know, but I certainly hope so. Over to you. Great, thank you very much. Okay, we're, draw we're drawing to the close. So let me take the opportunity to uh, remind you that this is the latest in a uh, series of joint uh, webinars between the uh, Economic Research Forum and the World Bank. And we've got sessions same time uh, next Tuesday with uh, one of uh, Asif's uh, col um, colleagues, Han Yujin from the World Bank, where be, uh, the discussants will be Ahmed Galal, former Minister of Finance uh, in Egypt, and Magda Kandil, Chief Economist at the Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates. And then on Wednesday, we have a session on labor market outcomes and female labor market participation with Nelly Al-Malak from the Paris School of uh, Economics. And the discussants will be Raghi Assad from Minnesota and Mona Saeed from the American University of Cairo. So that's the lineup. So do please join us then. In the meantime, as, as the time ticks over to, I think, 5 p.m. in Beirut and Cairo, uh, I'll say thank you very much uh, to all of you for joining us. Thank you very much for your questions. The conversation will continue, uh, and I'm sure Asif and his colleagues will welcome more input on their, on, on their work. Uh, thank you to Khalid, thank you to Hadi, and thank you to Asif. Take care. Stay well, everybody. Nice to see you all.